Uh, you'll be pleased to know I'm not going to sing either, in uh, <laughs> keeping with Father Geoffrey. Uh, as we are now all aware, following a period of prayer and reflection, uh, Bishop Philip decided last week that for the sake of God's mission in this diocese, he should withdraw from the appointment as the next Bishop of Sheffield. In the life of the diocese, the past few weeks have been difficult and painful. The appointment of Bishop Philip raised questions and concerns in the minds of many, both within the diocese and the wider Church of England. Others welcomed the announcement. Both those concerned about the appointment and those fully supportive of it, women and men and across traditions have experienced a sincere and deep sense of personal pain and hurt, which we have tried to respond to through the listening exercises. Alongside this, there's been a corporate sense of pain across the whole diocese, as we have struggled to hold things together in a spirit of unity, mutual respect and flourishing, built on confident relationships, dialogue and a focus on God's mission. What is clear is that there was more than one narrative being expressed and it's important that in relationship with God and each other we find a way of continuing to graciously listen, love and in a spirit of unity within our diversity as for healing, reconciliation and a way forward. Much of the hurt and pain caused has been through the use of social media and other media outlets including the Church Times which has clearly printed an article this week that is inaccurate. Perhaps that was inevitable but it has meant that as a diocese we have lived out our deeply held disagreements and concerns which it's right to express in the full glare of the media which has raised the temperature and the tensions. A number of the latter emails and letters I received have been concerned about this most public airing of our differences. Eventually, of course, the media will lose interest in us but we, as a diocese, must find a way forward of continuing in dialogue with each other. There is clearly much to reflect on, and there will, as I said in my statement last week, be time to consider what lessons there are to be learnt over the coming weeks and months. The National Church will also need to continue to reflect and pray about the issues that this has raised. I would, however, like also to take this opportunity of thanking all those who wrote to me or had individual conversations expressing their personal support for me in this most complex of times and as we seek God's wisdom. Your kindness and generosity to me has been greatly appreciated. As I've said before, it is my intention to support everyone as best as I am able as we make this journey with God and in relationship with each other. <coughs> A lot of the questions I've been asked have been concerned about process and in some cases questioning the validity and the legality of it. It's also become painfully clear that not everyone is familiar with the five guiding principles, mutual flourishing or new norms, new beginning. At a recent uh, Darson Synod uh, that I attended and I asked that question how many knew about the five guiding principles at a show of hands, uh, virtually no parish had actually seen it or discussed it. 
The nomination of Bishop Philip was made within the framework and the process agreed by General Synod, which reflects the aspirations of the Church of England to be a broad church that embraces diverse traditions. The Crown Nominations Commission, which is the nominating body, met on the 28th and the 29th of November to interview candidates. The CNC is a body with 14 voting and two non-voting members. The voting members are the two archbishops or their representative, six members elected by the diocese and six members elected by the General Synod. A third of the elected representatives, in our own case, were female. The non-voting members are the Prime Minister's and Archbishop's appointment secretaries. The appointment was made in line with the five guiding principles which were included within the House of Bishops Declaration on the Ministry of Bishops and Priests, which was part of the package on which the measure and canon made under it formed a part. It's been established for over two dec decades, both within the Church of England and within the Anglican Communion, that both positions, those who support the ordination and consecration of women, and those who in conscience cannot support it, are fully Anglican. For many years, the Church of England wrestled with how to accommodate this commitment to supporting both positions while also permitting the consecration of women as bishops. The Church's first formal attempt to do this failed, with the General Synod rejected the relevant legislation in November 2012. At the second time of asking, the Church of England did pass legislation to permit the consecration of women as bishops in July 2014, after a process of reflection and dialogue to learn the lessons of its previous failure. The package was agreed and passed into law in 2014. It was founded on a declaration by the House of Bishops approved by the General Synod. The declaration comprised the five guiding principles and above all the commitment to mutual flourishing for all traditions within the church. The declaration specific, specifically provides that a diocesan bishop may be either a bishop who does or who does not ordain women. A diocese may express a view prior to a diocesan see being filled as to whether the Darson Bishop should be someone who does or does not ordain women. In every case where the Darson Bishop does not ordain women, there should be at least one bishop in the diocese who does ordain women. Senior leadership roles within dioceses should continue to be filled by people from across the range of traditions. Those provisions are part of mutual flourishing that is central to the Declaration and to the package. The Declaration also recognises that, and I quote, there will need to be sensitivity to the feelings of vulnerability that some will have that their position within the Church of England will gradually be eroded and that others will have because not, and the concerns that others will have because not everyone will receive their ministry. It appreciates that the practical working out of these arrangements may not be easy for the church as a whole or for individuals. To reject the five guiding principles is to reopen the settlement made by the Church of England in 2014, which will enable both the supporters of women's consecration and those opposed to it to flourish alongside each other within the church. The document, New Norms, New Beginnings, which was commissioned by Bishop Stephen, recognised that this journey within the diocese would not be easy. It said, and again I quote, working towards a diocese where all can flourish and enjoy the highest possible degree of communion 
will take a significant commitment from every member of the church and will rely on consistent and clear leadership. It will be important for the diocese to explore ways of embedding the guiding principles within our culture. It will be important to find periodic ways of auditing where we are as a diocese against the guiding principles and to hold one another to account on our fulfilment of them. As I've reflected on the past few weeks on where we are as a diocese, I've been helped by a rereading of Bishop Tom Wright's commentary on Philippians 2 verses 1 to 4. It says, and I quote the passage, So if our shared life in the King brings you any comfort, if love still has the power to make you cheerful, if we really do have partnership in the Spirit, if your hearts are at all moved with affection and sympathy, then make my joy complete. Bring your thinking into line with one another. Here's how to do it. Hold on to the same love. Bring your innermost lives into harmony. Fix your minds on the same object. Never act out of selfish ambition or vanity. Instead, regard everybody as superior. Look after each other's best interests, not your own. And Tom Wright goes on to tell a story of actors in a play, needing to know exactly what each one is doing so that it fits together. Otherwise, he says, it becomes a circus act. On stage, the actors were not out for their own individual glory at each other's expense. The play worked, he says, because everyone worked together with the same object in mind. And that's a bit like Paul is urging on the church at Philippi. That, he says, is what the church should be like. There's an old Jewish joke that says, if you've got two rabbis, you've probably got three opinions. <laughs> And this is often how it feels in the church. As our own debate has highlighted, there are big theological differences. There are hurts and pains, some stemming from past experiences, some caused by recent events. It raises the whole question of how we can live together in the way Paul indicates. How can we think the same, loving each other completely, regarding everyone else and their opinions as superior to our own? To many, this may seem impossible, or at least a very long way off. The answer, as, Saint Paul, points out, as Paul points out, must be that everyone must be focused on something other than themselves. And we know very well that that is Jesus Christ, the King, the Lord, and God's mission to transform his world. This is the ministry and mission to which God has called us all, as clergy and laity, women and men, and whatever our tradition. This passage is about unity and its motivation. It's about our own inner lives and conviction and the practical outworking of it. Our motivation should be because we want to live this way. We know the comfort that comes from belonging to the body of Christ, the Christian family, from being in Christ Jesus. As we live in that family, we should endeavour to grow in love more and more, however difficult that may sometimes be. That love should sustain us, especially in the most difficult times of our relationship. As the Spirit-filled people of God, 
We should be desirous to work together more and more in a single direction as focused to our own diocesan vision. We have been called to grow a sustainable network of Christ-like, lively and diverse, diverse Christian communities in every place, which are effective in making disciples and in seeking to transform our society and God's world. The inner life of unity is, however, perhaps the thing that seems sometimes the most difficult. How can we possibly bring our thinking in line with each other? Unity by itself can't be the final aim. As Tom Wright points out in his commentary, our unity is, poss unity is possible among thieves and many other types. What matters, he goes on to say, is that Christians like the actors all focus single-mindedly on the play, on the divine drama that has unfolded in Jesus Christ the King and is continuing now in this final act with themselves, ourselves, as characters. Bringing their thinking, he says, into line with each other wouldn't be any good if they were all thinking something that was out of line with the Gospel. Our inner lives must reflect the Gospel. We must all remain fixed on the facts about Jesus and the meaning that emerges from them. We are called to perform the extraordinary feat of looking at one another with the assumption that everybody else and their needs are more important. Tom Wright tells another story. I once remember going to lunch with a friend who had invited about 20 or 30 people. Some of them were quite well-known public figures. As he said the grace at the start of the meal, he also said very firmly, remember, the most interesting person in the room is the one sitting next to you. Multiply that up a bit into a congregation and you'll get somewhere near what Paul is saying. So where are we now as a diocese? We are in a difficult and complex place with no clear guidelines as to how we move forward because no other diocese has been in this place before in this way. Are we damaged by recent disagreements? Yes, we are, but not terminally. I've heard people say, that mutual flourishing as a concept in this diocese is now set back 20 years. I hope and pray not. I sometimes wonder if I'm being naive. I've been accused over these past few weeks of pastoral platitudes. But I believe passionately that we are called to focus on the good news. And I do sincerely hope and pray that even with our differences, we can find a way of living together in unity and respect, focused, as Paul reminds us, on Christ and God's mission. If we can't, then we really do have some real soul-searching about where we are as a diocese and as God's people called to serve the whole of Sheffield and its people, who are themselves a diverse and mixed community. This won't be easy. I don't underestimate the real pain and hurt that has and continues to be felt across the traditions by women and men, clergy and laity. We may never get to the point, of course, of total agreement, and we certainly won't if we don't remain fixed on Christ. 
But I also believe that the final goal of living together in unity, focused on the good news and the transformation of people's lives, must be worth the effort. We are called to make this journey together in joy as women and men, seeking mutual flourishing and in the highest possible degree of communion. In the meantime, the Archbishop of York will in due course submit the name of an alternative candidate for the diocese. We are continuing to seek how we might continue the process of dialogue and confirmation. And I'm in conversation with uh, Sarah Hills, who some of you will know both from this diocese, and who's now the Director of Reconciliation in the Diocese of Coventry. I hope also that um, even if it's not your normal tradition, you will make an effort this year to attend the Blessing of the Oils on Monday in Holy Week at the Cathedral. Leading up to that, we're going to have seven days of prayer. There'll be more information about this soon. There'll be seven days of prayer uh, for healing and reconciliation and unity, and that will culminate in the service of the Blessing of Oils on Monday in Holy Week. And I close, as I did in my press statement, by reiterating what the Archbishop said to us all. We should use this time of Lent as a period of penitence, repentance and reflection, both individually and corporately. It is my sincere hope and prayer that such a period would act as the basis for reconciliation across the diocese as we rebuild relationships of trust and confidence and refocus on God's mission and our vision for growth and the transformation of communities. We should continue to pray for each other, pray together for ourselves, for our diocese, to pray for Bishop Philip, and also, of course, pray for the next person chosen by God to be the new Bishop of Sheffield, who will be coming into a slightly different diocese than it felt a few months ago. And of course, I will also continue to pray for each and every one of you.